Welcome to section 2.7. Okay, gentle people, in this lecture, what we're going to be talking about are molecules. So what molecules are, are an ensemble of atoms put together. So a whole bunch of atoms are going to come together, they're going to bond to each other, and this group of atoms are going to act like one entity. You can think of this package of atoms being one thing, and the properties of this thing are this whole assembly put together. So to give you guys an example, let's take a look at dioxygen made out of two oxygen atoms and ozone made out of three oxygen atoms. So the first thing you'll note is that these things have different properties even though they're constructed from the same atom. Dioxygen is made out of two things, ozone made out of three things. Oxygen is odorless to you. There's about 20% oxygen right around you and you couldn't detect that oxygen. However, ozone has a pungent spell to it. If you worked around a whole bunch of electronics, like a big server room, that kind of sharp smell, well, that's because there's a little bit of ozone generated. If I were to concentrate oxygen gas into a bottle, you'll note that it is a colorless gas. However, if I were to take ozone and concentrate it into a bottle, you'll notice a faint blue color. MP and BP, this is melting point and boiling point, and you can see that these numbers differ between oxygen and ozone. And one more thing, ozone is a super reactive chemical. Ozone is something that they use to purify our water and kill the bacteria in it so that it is safe to drink. If you were to breathe in 20% ozone, it would rip apart your lungs and you would have a very bad time. So what I want you guys to understand is even though these things are made out of oxygen atoms, they have completely different properties. Whatever the element is to construct the molecule, the molecule can have vastly different properties than the atoms it's constructed from. And even if you construct things from the same atoms, you can get completely different reactivities. So when we talk about this package of atoms, we're going to write down the chemical formula. Now, there are two main ones we want to cover in this lecture, and that is the empirical formula and the molecular formula. Now, the empirical formula is usually used when you're talking about ionic compounds. It gives you the smallest ratio of all the atoms in that chemical compound. For example, a grain of salt, NaCl, is not just one sodium and one chloride. It is made out of trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms. And so what I know is that there is one sodium per chloride, and that's why we like to use the empirical formula, because it would be kind of silly to write a grain of salt as Na 10 to the 30th and then Cl 10 to the 30th. Now, the molecular formula is what we use a lot of the times to describe a single molecule. It is telling you the actual number of atoms in that molecule. So let's go ahead and take a look at examples, and we'll start out with the molecular formulas. So if you were to look at one water molecule and you wanted to see how that water molecule was constructed, you can separate all the other molecules, isolate one molecule of water, and it would consist of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So you write it as H2O. Now for the empirical formula, we want the lowest ratio, and it turns out for water, the empirical formula and the molecular formula are the same. But let's take a look at hydrogen peroxide. If I were to isolate hydrogen peroxide, just one molecule, how I would see this molecule is it's constructed out of two oxygens and two hydrogens. Now what I can do is I can reduce this to the empirical formula. The hydrogen and oxygen are in a one-to-one -one ratio, and so that's what the empirical formula is going to tell me. Now what you'll note is this is the basic representation of a formula. Sometimes they will not be able to distinguish chemical compounds. So for example, ethanol and dimethyl ether, these are two different chemical compounds. You can see their molecular formula right here, and you'll note that the empirical formula is the same as the molecular formula. 
but you would have to have a different type of formula to distinguish, and we will show you when, when we hit the organic chemistry chapter how we can distinguish and what other formulas are available to us. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and focus in on ionic compounds. So ionic compounds are compounds that are made out of two ions that are stuck together using electrostatics, meaning I have something that's positive, something that's negative, and if I have two opposite charges, they are going to attract each other. Now again, I want to remind you guys that a grain of salt is not just one Na and one Cl stuck together. You'll never see that in a grain of salt. What you'll see is that you have a sodium ion and it is surrounded by chloride ions. But those chloride ions are surrounded by sodium ions. So this is a crystal structure of an ionic compound. And this is what I mean by saying that a grain of salt is made out of trillions upon trillions of atoms. And it is not just one Na stuck to a Cl. So how do we make an ionic compound? So what we need to do is we need to make ions. Now in the last lecture, we said that sodium, it's a metal, and metals tend to lose electrons. So metals will make positive charges. On the other hand, non-metals, they tend to make negative charges. And so what's happening here is that the sodium is gonna lose an electron, the chloride is going to gain an electron. So I'm gonna get a positive ion, a cation, and I'm gonna get a negative ion, an anion, and these things are going to go ahead and stick together. So a real easy way to identify ionic compounds is if you see a metal and a non-metal stuck together, chances are that's an ionic compound. Now this isn't the only way that ionic compounds are gonna form. What I want you guys to make sure is that you guys look at the polyatomics, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The polyatomic ions are going to be ions. So if I have an ion and another ion, well, then I can form an ionic compound. So when you see a molecule, always ask yourself, is there a polyatomic ion in there? And we'll talk about them a little bit later. But let's focus on this metal and non-metal interaction. What you guys have to understand is that when I form these ionic compounds or these crystals with trillions upon trillions of atoms, I want to make sure that I am neutral, meaning that all the positive charges are balanced out by all the negative charges. So let's take a metal and let's take calcium. Calcium is in the second row. So yes, it does lose electrons like sodium, but in this case, it loses two electrons. So the common ion that calcium forms is calcium two plus. Now let's combine calcium with fluorine. Fluorine's a halogen and it goes to the minus one ion. So what I wanna to put together is calcium two plus and fluorine minus. Now what you'll notice is that there is two positives here and only one negative here. So to balance the charges out, I'm gonna to have to double the amount of fluorines that I am going to use in my crystal structure. So when these two come together, I want my calcium and fluorine to be in a one to two ratio. And you guys can see the picture right here. What you will see is this is the one to two ratio. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to write what ions are formed by each one of these chemical compounds. And if they were to come together into an ionic compound, write the formula of the ionic compound. When you guys are done, go ahead and choose the right answer on your quiz. All right, gentle people, let's take a look at this. So potassium K is in the first column of my periodic table so it will lose one electron. Chlorine is a halogen. It is right next to the noble gases and one off. So that means it's going to make the chloride ion or the minus one. So what we have is plus one, minus one. This is gonna to come together in a one to one ratio. The next one, calcium, we just talked about. Calcium is in the second column. So it's gonna make the two plus cation. 
oxygen is two away from my noble gases. It's a non-metal, so it's gonna make the two minus anion. So if I were to put these together, two plus, two minus, this again comes together in a one-to-one -one ratio. Now this last one, calcium again, two plus, chlorine we just talked about, making the one minus. So in this case, my charges are not balanced. So I'm gonna have to increase the amount of one of these ions. So in this case, I need twice as much chlorine as I need calcium. So to put this together, I'm gonna keep this in a one to two ratio. Okay, general people, let's go ahead and up the ante and ask ourselves a question that is a little bit more involved. So go ahead and read this prompt and decide which is the best choice. Okay, general people, let's start out with our ionic compound, XCl2. So what I can do is I can first figure out what the charge of X is. Chlorine is a halogen and it has one minus as its charge. There are two of them. So that gives me a total contribution from all the chlorines as a two minus charge here. Now I don't know what the charge of X is, but I do know that there's only one of them. So what I do know is that if I sum up the charge, add the two minus from the chlorine, this will get me a neutral ionic compound. So in this case, the charge is going to be two plus. So what I can say is that X in this ionic compound is two plus. Now the next thing it says is if I look at this ion, this ion has 36 electrons. And so what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and figure out what X really is. Now remember, electrons don't define the atom, protons define the atom. So what I wanna know is how many protons are in here. Well, if the two plus ion of X has 36 electrons, X that is neutral, well, it would have 38 electrons. Because to get to this two plus, I would have had to lost two electrons. So to get back to the neutral, I would have to add two more electrons. Now, if it's neutral, that means it has the same number of electrons as protons, so X must have 38 protons. And so if X has 38 protons, well, I can look at the periodic table, look at the atomic number, and element number 38 is strontium. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the way that you should tackle that problem. If you derive this some other way, I would be very careful because that is the logic that I wanted you guys to follow. Well, I hope that made sense and remember to stay safe, M1A.